I'm Steve and welcome to Woodworking Masterclass Season 2. This is where I normally say, welcome to my workshop, but as you can tell, I'm not in my workshop. Season 2 is going to be focused on box making and instead of going to my own personal timber stash, what I thought I'd do is come to a timber merchant's just to give you an idea of what choices are available to you other than your normal hardware stock. So before you go into a timber yard, there's a couple of things that are really handy to have. Have a list of the dimensions you want on a notepad, a pencil, a measuring tape, and if the timber yard will let you, a block plane. Then you can see what the timber looks like. Okay, so come with me. We'll go up, meet Gareth, and find out what's available. G'day Steve, how are you today? G'day mate, good, good. good. What can we um, do for you today? Doing a couple of boxes, and uh, I was wondering if I could get some timber from me. I, I need about oh, a metre and fifty. So the box, the finished height is about 80 mil high, so what would I need width wise? Uh, 100 mil. Oh, okay, so 100 and, mil would be rough sawn. Rough sawn. Okay. And, then, and, and we can dress it all around or DAR yeah. to your required size. Oh, terrific. Okay. Yeah. Can we go and have a look and see what you yeah, got? Yeah, sure. Terrific. Yeah. Let's go. Steve, this is the, the 50 mil Zebrano. All right. I know it's thicker than what you want, yep. but I thought I'd just show you this first up. Okay. The Zebrano is quarter sawn yep. with the grain pattern running straight up and down. So that, that's more stable. More stable. Timber. Okay. Considered and to be more stable. This one's what they call back sawn. That's back sawn. In veneer, they call it crown cut. Okay. That, so the grain runs from side to side in back sawn, face to face in quarter sawn. Okay. Uh, quarter sawn gives you, in these, most species, a straight line. Yep. Crown cut or back sawn gives you a wavy cathedral a type grain. Okay. Well, this is a bit big. Um, do you have any of these in shorts? We've got some shorts in the racks. Yeah. Various sizes, various dimensions. So it depends on the species and what we've got to recover out no, of. No, I reckon one will tell me. Let's go and have a look at your shorts. Yep. Okay. If you want some cedar, I've got some cedar just up here. All right. Yeah, there's a yeah. piece there. That's that's a little bit of rough sawn, 100 by 25. Can I, I just, think that can is I some just of run the Spanish cedar. Over to see what colour I've got. Yep. Colour in the cedar will vary depending on the species of cedar, from light pinks to dark. Oh reds. yeah, no, that's nice because you can't really tell through the dirt. No, no, that's good. No. Okay, yeah, I'll have that bit. Okay. And hey, what's that bit over there? Is that Which Queensland one's that? walnut? Is it? Uh, Queensland, no, Queensland maple. maple. That one's <laughs> Queensland walnut. maple. That's another quarter wow. sawn piece. Yeah. With some crossfire. Uh, in the in the pattern and so yeah. forth. Yeah, oh, that's extraordinary. Uh, that's quite a nice piece of uh, nice piece of timber. Right. Yeah, no, I'll have that. Ha that one. Um, and that and yeah. uh, veneers. You said you had some veneers. We've got some veneers just yep. up here. Okay. Steve, this is some of the veneers. This is this is some of the. I don't know where that'll show it up, but that's some of the Queensland maple. Wow. And that was cut out of a stump. That's I guess the, the advantage too with veneer is you're not wasting a lot of timber, are you? You're getting no. maximum impact with minimum um, use of the resource. Hey, now, there's is there's that a little Zabana? bit of black bean. No, oh, that's black bean. That's is black it? bean. That's, again, that's quarter cut. Yeah. Um, Gee, it looks like Sobrano, doesn't it? Yeah. But what's that? that yeah, is, this that's one's, incredible. That's this a, is called by several names uh, New Guinea rosewood or Nara. So is, is, this, is this actual timber or? This is, t this is timber. Again, it's a burl. Oh, that's the growth yeah. on the. Yeah. Okay, yeah. A big lump on the side of a tree. Wow. So that, that gives you some pretty pretty distinctive grain patterns in that. Yeah. All right, yep. mate, if you can give me the damage on this, yep. I'll leave we'll you in peace. Down to that. Mate, you want to you use, use my calculator? Because I've got it programmed. Ours is programmed too. It adds 20% without you even seeing me touch the button. Hey, uh, how's that? mine. Right, hey. I. That won't hurt you, will yeah. it? Actually, no, mate, that, that's pretty reasonable. Can you, can, you, can you put it down as car repair so I don't let me miss it, know how much I'm spending? Okay, okay, we get that a lot, you know. <laughs> well, there you go. I've got my timber, and now I can officially say, welcome to my shed, and welcome to the new season. What we've got to do now is machine this up. We'll go next door to the machine shop and I'll plane and thickness this. But before I do that, I have promised two people I'd say hello. So hello, Nicholas. Hello, Raven. See you soon. Okay, let's go to the workshop. Okay, now I'm going to joint the board on this jointer. 
And the reason I joined it before I thickness it is because it'll give me a nice flat plane so when it goes through the thicknesser, it'll come out parallel. I always look at the timber before I dress it and if there's a bow in it, I'll make sure that the bow is uppermost. This is fairly straight, that's okay. And I'll check the grain. So I'm actually planing with the grain, not against the grain. And this is very highly figured timber and I'm fortunate enough to have a spiral cut ahead, which means it's not gonna give me much tear out. Thing with a jointer, this is a great idea. If you've got a jointer at home, do that to yours. A couple of bits of masking tape so you know where the cutting surface is and never pass your hand over the blade. Bring it up to a point, take it away, and then join it on the other table. Okay, let's go. It's nice and flat. There's no tear out, that's to the helix cutter. But you can see how much high figures there. Now I'll go over to the thicknesser and I'll machine it to thickness. Let's check the thickness of this board. It's just under 40 mil. So I'll set my cutter blades to just over 40 mil because I like to not run the risk of having the blades digging in. So sometimes you do that the first pass, it doesn't remove anything, but at least you get an idea of where you're at. As you can see, I've got some hit and miss, but I know where the register of the blades are. So now I'll take a two mil cut and we'll come it through and it'll clean the board up nearly all the way. As you can see, we've now got a beautiful, highly figured piece of timber that's parallel. I'd go back to the jointer now and I'll shoot a square edge on this and then I'd put it through the thicknesser again. So then I've got a board that's DAR, which is dressed all around, nice and square and clean. Wow, I'm impressed. That's really highly figured timber and it dressed it so nicely. What I want to do now is to rip saw it up the middle and then we can put it together to make the panel. So just before the break, I'll do that. You might notice with my bandsaw, I've got a resaw fence. Now, not every bandsaw has a resaw fence. So if you don't, I'll show you how to cut or resaw without using the fence. I know the thickness of the finished article that I want. So I make a marking gauge and I mark down both edges of the timber. And then I'll run the saw blade at that gap in the middle. It takes a little bit more machining, but it's a better way to go. And also make sure that you're square on the bottom to the sides when you're using a bandsaw. Okay, I'll start cutting this and then we'll go off to a break. So I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back. Okay, during the break I finished sanding the uh, raised panel for the solid timber one and also resawed and dressed the sides and the back and the ends for the carcass for the timber one. We don't need that right now, but with the raised panel, a lot of people like what they call book matched. Now book matched is literally when you open a piece of timber you've just sawn and then you have a look at it. Now in this case, if we've got an overhead, you'll see that the grain matches. So this is a mirror image of this. However, there's a couple of shortcomings with book matched and I'll show you what. I've marked the direction of the grain. So if I was to plane this bit of material, I'd be planing it from me to you and we're laying the grain down. But look what happens once you book match. If you book match, then you can see the grain has changed direction. This still runs the same way, but the bottom one runs the opposite way. Now what that causes when you join them together, when it goes through a machine, one side will lay the grain down and you'll get a clear cut, but the other half will be furred up and you'll get tear out. So another alternative to book match is what I prefer, and it's slip match. Now slip match, as the name would imply, you slide the top onto the bottom and join them. And then if you have a look, the grain directions are running the same way. So especially in high figure timber, this gives you a much cleaner finish when you're machining. 
So in this case, I'll slip match it and I want to have a good sealed joint between the two. If you watched last season, what we did was a sprung joint. In this case, I don't need a sprung joint because the end grain is going to be encapsulated in timber so it won't dry out and I doubt if it'll split. But I do want to make sure I've got a good mating surface. Seeing these are highly figured bits of timber, I wouldn't use just a normal block plane or a straight blade plane. What I'm going to use in this case is what they call a toothing plane. I'm not sure if we can get a close up of that, but if we can, it's got a serrated edge. So what it does, it doesn't just uh, plane the timber normally in, in wide bits, it's very small indentations taking out little curly bits of grain so we don't get much tear out. So let's put this in the vise. We'll dress this bit up. That's how I want it to go. Get it pretty even. And with the toothing plane, it doesn't matter if you go, whoops, better put the water in there. See, Alzheimer's disease has got me too. Remember, that's the best thing you've got for holding something firm in a vise. Now, with the toothing plane, it doesn't matter which way I go, against the grain, across the grain, it won't give me tear out, but it'll give me a nice flat surface. And if I look at that, I can see the toothing marks all the way across, so I know it's going to be a good mating surface. Put it together, no light. Okay, glue them up. Now what I use is waxed lunch wrap with the wax surface up front. You can use oven bake, which is really good, but my wife doesn't have it, so I couldn't nick it. This is the only stuff I could get. And the reason I put it in the vise is the glue then, if it drops onto the screw thread of the vise, it doesn't clog it up because you've got the paper in between. Bit of glue either side. Where's Bob? He loves this glue. Want some glue, mate? No, too interested in the cameraman. So I'll pop this in here. And you'll notice I haven't bothered dressing the timber before I glued it together. And the reason for that is at this stage, it's not necessary. You can if you want, but it really it's just a waste of time. Okay, that'll do that. Now what we've got to do is move on to the actual box itself, the carcass. Some decisions you have to make. First of all, what do you like on the outside? What do you like on the top? What do you like on the bottom? For example, and there's no right or wrong, it's whatever pleases you. There's a bit of a blemish there. A lot of people wouldn't like that, so they'd actually put it on the inside. Personally, I like it, so I'm putting that on the outside. To me, it looks better on the bottom than if it was on the top. So then what I'll do is grab a pencil and mark the inside bottom and then I know how the box goes together. Same with all the other pieces. Have a look at the grain. To me, that looks better that way. Yep. So that's how that back or front's going to go. So what you do, that with all your sides, and you'll end up marking them all on the inside, bottom, so you know what you're working with. Now with this, a little bit of forward planning goes into place. And what you have to do is work out what you want on the inside and what you want on the outside, because what we're going to do is we're going to route a half round on the inside of the box top, on the top of the box. And we do that using a router bit. Now I've got th three router bits I'll use for dressing this box up. The first one is a roundover bit with a bearing and that puts a nice little curve that I'm looking for. The second one is a quarter inch, which will be a slot, which is what I'm going to put the raised panel in. And the third one is a wider straight bit, which I'm going to take a rebate at the bottom of the inside of the box because I want to have a concealed panel in there. That's for the bottom. I don't want it just tacked onto the bottom. By the way, if you don't have a router or you haven't got a router bit, there are a lot of other ways that you can create slots in boxes. Here's just a few. If you want to take a year or so out and learn how to use a 45, 
It's well worth the effort and they're a tremendous hand tool. You can do straight rebates, you can do uh, curves, all sorts of trenching with those. They're on eBay, I think Clifton might have bought them out as a brand new one now. It's the uh, Old Woman's Tooth or Stanley 71 router. And as you can see, it's got just a cutting bit that'll give you a slot at that width. It does come with other size um, cutters. Or if all else fails, there's a saw, a chisel, and a mallet. So with all those at your disposal, it shouldn't be any problems. Or the other way, of course, is you can put it over the table saw. Now I put mine over the table saw sometimes, and I know my blade width is three mil. So it's two widths of my blade will give me a quarter inch uh, dado if you like. So let's whip over to the router and we'll quickly route all these and then we'll come back and we'll start putting things together. Okay? Okay, now we've got the round over bit. As you can see it's got a nice rounded edge on the top inside of the box on all four panels. Now we'll put the slot in, whoops sorry, we'll put the slot in for the panel to sit in and the slot I have just at the end of that curve, a oh, quarter of an inch or six mil wide. Okay, let's go and do that. Now we've got the round over done and the slot's cut. What we have to do now is do a rebate so we can put our recessed bottom into it. Now that again will be done with a router bit. In this case, it's about a half inch router bit. So let's go and do those. Well, that's taking care of all the parts for the timber box. Now we're moving on to the ply and veneer box. As you can see, I've got all the ply that I picked up the other day. We won't be needing this one for a while. This is a burl, and I'll show you that in a much later episode. So I'll pop that over there for the moment. What we've been going to be working with, this is going to be the feature veneer, which is black bean, and this is going to be the backing veneer. An interesting thing, when you work with veneers, is whatever you do to one side of the substrate, you have to do to the other. I've got some plywood here. I use birch ply. It's slightly more expensive than what you buy at normal uh, hardware outlets, but the thing is it's a much better quality and you don't get voids and gaps. So I've got a 10 mil and a 6 mil. The 6 mil I use for the lid, the 10 mil I use for the bottoms and for the sides. But let's get onto the veneer. With veneer, there is a right side and a wrong side. And if you know how veneer is made, it's sliced with a knife. And as the knife comes off the flitch, it breaks all the fibres on one side. So one side has got open fibres and one side's got closed fibres. The easiest way to check is pick a bit of veneer up and bend it. See how far that one bends there? And then bend it the other way and that's how far that'll bend. So when it bends the furthest, that's the side you want to go down onto your substrate. What I do is whenever I work out which side is meant to go down, I get a pencil and then I'll draw a line on the downside. Because if you start doing a lot of veneering, you end up with boxes and boxes of scrap. And if you choose to get into marquetry or parquetry, it's much easier to pick up a bit of veneer. And if you see a pencil mark, you know exactly which side to go down. Okay, and this is black bean again. Bends a bit that way, this is very brittle, and it'll only bend that far. So I'll mark pencil down there. Also, veneers have got different properties when it comes to cutting. I'll give you a couple of examples. Here's a little trick too. When you're gonna cut veneer with a ruler, put some 240 wet and dry on the back with double-sided tape. That way, the ruler won't slip on the veneer and you can get a clean cut. This is chili and myrtle I'm cutting here and it's pretty easy to use. And it's not a question of forcing the knife, it's just gently gliding the knife over with about the weight of the knife. So not too much pressure at all. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's coming away nicely and it should be away now. So that was about six drawers of the knife. However, if we try it on a bit of black bean, find a nice bit, you'll notice that this is a lot tougher and you can hear it. 
It's a lot more fibrous. And this is going to take me maybe 12, 14 cuts. See, this is where we should do time lapse, but they're getting to make me work hard, so I'll go through it. Okay. Just be careful at the end that you don't tear the fibres and rip the bottom of the veneer. Now this was a destroyed bit anyway, so I'm throwing that away, but there's my nice straight edge. All right, so that's how you tell the top and the bottom from the veneers. Now the other thing is, when you're working with plywood, if you look at the grain on the plywood, in this case it's going this way, the veneer has to run 90 degrees to the grain of the plywood. So in this case, the grain's running this way, that's the downside, I would run it like that. If you're veneering solid timber, the opposite is true. The grain of the veneer has to run the same direction as the grain of the timber. So let's start gluing some of this up and I'll show you a couple of ways you can veneer and also how different properties affect the, the gluing process. Once again, I use hide glue. Go down to the kitchen, grab some lunch wrap, greasy side up, and I double glue. So I'll do the top first. What I'll do is glue Doesn't matter if you splash a bit everywhere. Old Bob's getting excited. He loves the smell of this stuff. Doesn't matter if you get glue on the top. If you're using PVA, um, sometimes it's a little bit different because PVA is a lot harder to get off than hide glue. Hide glue, when it dries, it actually crystallises. So when you sand it, it gives you a nice flat finish and also acts as a bit of a grain filler. Now, I'll just place it on top. And I'll get a veneer hammer, which I've got a one or two here. If you want to get really ornate, that's ebony, brass and coca bowler. Well, that's a bit of dowel and a bit of tassie oak. Now you start in the middle of the substrate and you go out in chevron sort of pattern and lays it all nice and flat. There's your first bit of veneer laid. Now, you might think, oh, this is veneering's easy. Watch what happens when I start using black bean. By the way, with cutting, the easiest timber I've ever cut is Madrona. I can do that in about two or three passes of a knife. The worst one I've ever done is Wenge. It takes me about 38 passes of the knife. So you just can't rush it because you'll ruin your bit of veneer. Put a nice little glue on. Go over the edges. It's much easier to clean glue off rather than try and put glue on. Now, I will just use a hammer on this. Actually, this bit's making a bit of a liar out of me, but it is still curling up a little bit of the edges. So if that's the case, what I'll do, especially with high glue, I don't recommend you do this with PVA, is I'll put a lot of glue on the top of the veneer which evens the moisture content out, also fills the grain and makes it a lot easier to lay it flat. And most of the glue comes out as you can see. And there you have it. So what I do now is get a couple of cords. Best thing, go to a, a kitchen making shop, get some offcuts, put some newspaper, down, bit of lunch wrap over the top. Just place this. Gets a bit sticky. You can tell this is live, can't you? That goes on the top. And again, wax part down. And you'll see next week when we take these out what a good job this lunch wrap does. Now you'll notice that I've got a book press here that I'm going to press this with. If you don't have a book press, it doesn't matter. A Besser block, or I'll tell you a really good weight, nine litre bucket of water. One litre of water equals a kilo, so that's a nine kilo weight. If you put that on there and leave it overnight, it's going to do exactly the same job as this press. I'll just push this in here. 
and we pull that down and that's it until next week so this is steve saying thanks for joining me and pulling the shed door down and saying remember to keep it sharp but more importantly keep it safe and i look forward to seeing you next week